Okay, so I'm uh, Harry Halpin from the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, visiting researcher at Saint Pompidou, Erie. And in my sort of day job, like Smari, I, uh, I, I, I work on technology um, issues. But what drives me, what interests me, and what makes myself, I think, many other technologists work on these issues is not uh, what uh, Norbert Wiener called gadget worshiping, not just a sheer love of the gadget, but actually a desire to understand the sort of philosophical and social and historical forces um, that shape our world today, of which technology is probably the most, I would say, dominant. Uh, I don't know if you want to do so now and we switch off. Um, I'm Smart McCarthy. Um, I do various things. Um, none of it is really. Meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> well, best introduction ever. And, um, and so this lecture is going to be a lecture about the sort of foundations. It's called Societal Cybernetics. It'll be a dual lecture between myself, who will provide, as uh, I want to do, the sort of historical and philosophical background of how cybernetics became applied to society. And then Smari is going to inform you about the more sort of, I would say, uh, developments coming from staff of beer and a certain branch of cybernetics and how they were applied to issues around democracy and voting and these sort of things today. Um, so I'm going to begin. I, I, I was also trying to discover how is it that concepts from cybernetics uh, began to be thought of as applicable to society, to change how politics and democracy work. It's very interesting. Um, so so they're, they're, it's perhaps one of the most fundamental revolutions of our times, but it's not particularly well documented. Cybernetics itself was considered, as I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, this being one of the more interesting cybernetics research groups in the world. Um, cybernetics itself was considered the, the, about man and machine as a single, a single how would you say, uh, system of command and communication. Control and communication. And this was originally thought of in sort of very, I would say, simple terms. You know, Norbert Wiener's initial work around how do we use feedback loops to, for example, help shoot down ballistic missiles in World War II. However, during World War II, it, it did become clear that there was going to be a larger problem about how to rebuild society. Um, during the 1940s, um, there was a very interesting symposium held called Science, Philosophy, and Religion. It was a series of symposiums. And this was during the 1942, it was kind of unclear who was actually going to win the Second World War. Um, and it was hypothesized that there would be so much carnage and destruction and catastrophe after the end of the Second World War that the, there would be a sort of once in a lifetime chance to rebuild society in the form of some sort of uh, democratic ideal. However, it was not clear how to do that. So these think tanks were established where they were sort of saying, well, uh, if we were going to rebuild society, how would we do it? And the two people who were invited, who kind of crossed over into cybernetics, were uh, Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson. So, oh. Regardless, um, Margaret Mead has this very good point where she states, um, as an anthropologist, that if we attempt to steer or control uh, society, how is it that we, as the people who are programming society, are actually providing some measure of freedom or openness? I think it's a very good question. And interestingly enough, her husband responds, and this is, to my knowledge, the first sort of, this is 1942, um, this is the first sort of thinking of how can we conceptualize or operationalize freedom in terms of cybernetics. Bates responds, me to say perfectly clearly that there's a new shift in the emphasis, emphasis or gestalt of our thinking will be sending human civilization forth into uncharted waters. We cannot know what ma manner of human beings will result from such a course. And are we, the scientists who he's talking to here, to reserve 
the techniques and the right to manipulate people as the privilege of a few planning, goal-oriented, and power-hungry individuals to whom the instrumentality of science makes a natural appeal. Now that we have these techniques from social science, um, are we in cold blood going to treat people as things? What are we going to do with these things, these techniques? And then he states, we may be able to get a more definite, so it's a very good question, an operational definition of such habits as free will, if we ask about each what sort of experimental learning context would we devise in order to inculcate this habit? How would we rig the maze or problem box so that an anthropomorphic rat shall obtain a repeated and reinforced impression of his own free will? So it's a very interesting quote. So he sort of said, yes, we have this problem with freedom. And if we're designing freedom, how, are we, how is it that we're actually free? At the same point, he says, if we really want to understand freedom, we have to give it a scientific understanding. And we can imagine that the scientific definition of freedom is creating a form of technology in which people think they're free. So it's a very, uh, I would say, disturbing beginning. But you can always see in the 1940s, this question of freedom in science and technology is already becoming, uh, how do you say, fascinating. And, and Wiener uh, later, he was the founder of cybernetics, at least from the American school, basically argued with Bateson that this was a, 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 that applying cybernetics to society was fundamentally dangerous. And his argument was mathematical. His argument was that the main quantities affecting society are not only statistical, but because the runs of statistics which they are based on are excessively short. So when you take statistics about voting patterns or uh, who likes who or who's uh, eating what kind of food. The kinds of patterns that at least they were taking in the 1950s were based on surveys which were ran over incredibly short periods of time. So he argues because of this, uh, we need runs, we need long, long runs of statistics under essentially constant conditions. So he's sort of saying, well look, this all ends up being incredibly important. In order to actually test to see if the scientific techniques, the cybernetic techniques that we're applying to society are bringing forth the kinds of results we want, we have to hold, just like any other good scientist, we have to hold the other conditions constant. We have to have an experimental condition and a control condition. And thus, he says, the human sciences are a very poor testing ground for new mathematical techniques. And furthermore, and then he, 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 he brings up a point which is, I think, the main fear that, uh, uh, that we're seeing around cyber, social cybernetics. And he, he believes that the fear is the creation of a society of ants. And he says that I am convinced that a community of human beings is far more useful than a community of ants. And that the human being is condemned and restricted to perform the same functions over and over again. He will not even be a good ant, not to mention a good human being. So there is obviously, at the very birth of cybernetics itself, a debate over whether or not it can be applied to society. So on the one hand, a large amount of fear, um, well-grounded in the fact that humans are not easily controlled. Society is actually excessively complex. That it's not clear how you can tell if your technique is working, and maybe the only way you can make your technique work is to actually shape human beings themselves. And this is what's come back today. So there's many, many, many critics of uh, the sort of the, the cybernization of society, the increased usage of techniques. I think one of the more intelligent ones is Bernard Stiegler, who says uh, essentially, you know, we, while we can talk about providing better access to the internet, without such a politics, a politics that takes these issues of freedom and autonomy central to this new cybernetic society, the inevitable destiny of digital, digital brain is to find itself slowly but surely shortcutted by automata. Right? Incapable of constituting a new form of society. That while automation is incredibly important, it makes digitization possible. It, also, it, it, it inc incommensurably, he's not arguing that it's not increasing our intelligence. He's saying it actually does make us more intelligent, but it also has the problem that under certain conditions, otherwise known as the conditions of late capitalism, it could shortcut our ability to actually genuinely obtain freedom, that we would be effectively you know, manipulated by sort of the manipulation of 
our memories, of our digital, of our habits, and all of these things into sort of being uh, what Bernard fears is consumerist. Um, and there was an interesting, so we had this large debate at the beginning of cybernetics, and eventually it sort of spins in multiple directions. Um, perhaps the most interesting direction was uh, a direction in South America. Umberto Maturana, who was studying with Wiener, um, basically noticed that while one of the problems with cybernetics was this uh, point, which I think you go over and second order cybernetics goes over and Wiener and Maturana goes over in a sort of different way, that there was this presumed objectivity. But how can you, as a scientist, really stand outside of a system, including a social system, and attribute sort of meaning and information to it? And that Umberto Maturana, coming from a biological background, basically sort of said, well, you know, any organism is a circular organization which sort of defines itself by its own continual reproduction. And we see echoes of this and notions of social reproduction from Marxism. We have uh, this thought, and Nick was applied to legal systems and society in a sort of conservative manner by Nicholas Luhmann. But effectively, all the basis is that systems self-organize and they self-organize for stability, but there's a crucial difference between Maturana and eventually Vrela's theory and classical cybernetics. While well, classical cybernetics aim for this homeostasis, a sort of preservation of negentropy, of the reverse entropy, this preservation of order against the decline and the waste and the transformation of things, the randomness and disorder, Maturana and Vrela says, well, look, that's not how living beings work. Living beings work in an environment which is naturally out of order, and which they can bring into order by sort of being off stasis and then entering structural couplings with other organisms, with other parts of the environment, and then bringing themselves back into stasis, and then eventually you know, dying and falling apart. Now this concept of creation is very interesting, because eventually, and Smart will discuss this much more, uh, influence people that look at the concept of cybernetics um, particularly Stafford Beer, was an English uh, sort of management scientist, and figured out how can we apply them to society, to corporations. And eventually he was shipped over, uh, shipped over to Chile, where he created a system uh, where he wanted to apply the system to the Chilean social democracy under Allende. And effectively his vision uh, not Maturana, this is Beer, but sort of Maturana students like Fernando Flores were helping Beer in this endeavor. They were all sort of heavily influenced by cybernetics. But in the, in the middle, you can imagine that if society was thought of as a cybernetic organism, you can imagine there's different autoparietic systems, right? There's a worker in the middle, an individual, he belongs to another system, a crew, a workshop, a department, a firm, and you go all the way up to the whole nation and then possibly the global market is left out because this was the 70s. Um, and then Stafford Beer felt you could conceive of all of society as a set of interlocking social organisms. And what you want to do is you wanted to figure out how you could control them by, by sort of subtly changing things and monitoring the feedback loops. And this would, for at least for Allende, increase industrial production, which is what he needed as he was trying to socialize all the industries in Chile. The problem was, of course, how do you keep production up? So if you lose what Allende called the war of production, you would essentially let, let the economy collapse and then uh, socialism in Chile would be bankrupt. Of course, eventually, uh, they were planning to build this sort of cybernetic control center, socialist internet, as it's called, called Project Cinco or Cybersen, for uh, Chile. It never got completed and was destroyed by Allende, but it's sort of interesting. No, sorry, about to that. that. And however, from this destruction, and I'll, I'll try to speed up and end, a number of interesting connections uh, came out. Um, the, the concepts of cybernetics, even though they did not work out in Chile to establish a sort of workers' self-managed democratic society, and that even though the, the, the fundamental objections of Wiener and other people were not, I would say, ever fully answered, um, you know, Fernando Flores fled Pinochet, uh, was dropped off at the airport in San Francisco by Amnesty International, picked up at the airport by happenstance, actually, by Terry Winograd, who was an artificial intelligence uh, scientist. And, you know, started talking the car, and then became a student, and then worked together for a few years. And then eventually established a new book, a new sort of line of thought, 
where they sort of said, well, the problem with both cybernetics and artificial intelligence is that you're trying to basically, you know, you're, 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 not, you're not understanding how systems can be repaired. And, you're, and you're, not, you're trying to replicate intelligence in terms of intelligent machines. Actually, what you want to do is you want to build environments for humans that increase their intelligence. And the way to do that is to sort of not pretend and have a sort of rational Cartesian intelligence model going in the, based on representation going in the back of, our, of, of their head. But by sort of combining Maturana with Heidegger, which is a very interesting intellectual move, um, basically sort of say, we, we don't even want to build stable systems. We want to look at when systems break down and then build environments that allow us to dynamically repair the breakdown. And then by repairing these breakdowns and taking these breakdowns seriously and engineering around them, we can build even new and better kinds of cybernetic systems. Um, a few, uh, about 10 years later, Google came out with Winograd students. You can sort of see that you know, the Winograd moved away from artificial intelligence, moved to design, sort of saying, well, you know, if you want to prevent people from having breakdowns in their machinery, want people to use their machinery properly, they should you know, have a clear screen, not, unencum not encumbered like Yahoo with a bunch of stuff. And that this, I think that the present sort of cybernization of the world is to a large extent uh, being brought out by Google. And, and the reason why I think Google's sort of successful at it, or at least let's say more successful than Project CyberSyn and, and uh, other projects, is not just pure uh, historical contingency. It's also because they, they, they ultimately do have, unlike I would say most uh, technology companies do, a pretty sophisticated um, political understanding of the world. It's not as very sophisticated as some people's, but it's definitely exists and they have a lot of power behind it. And so what, what Google is sort of saying, and there's a number of books that came out recently, New Digital Age is quite good, I'd also recommend the, the, the new management book, How Google Works, which explains how Google is looking, just like Stafford Beer, looking at how do we harness creativity, how do we harness uh, intelligence in these sort of large firms, how do we use this to affect really wide scale change, but also not have the firm spin out of control? How do we not have the firm collapse? And then how can we apply, in the new digital age, how can we apply the tools that we've learned from organizing Google to organizing society in general? Um, and the, the main point they make is that the, and I think this is a very relevant point that was just hinted at after World War II, is that after World War II, the, the nation state eventually entered a state of decline and now a state of collapse. And the traditional Fordist corporation, after sort of compromise, has also had this collapse. And that this is sort of being replaced, this sort of centralized form of sovereign power, uh, which is not which is pre-cybernetic, is being replaced by a more diffuse uh, form of cybernetic power. And, and for Google, this is a platform that unlike a traditional corporation, which simply sells you things, a platform has a back and forth relationship with consumers and suppliers. It, it, it listens to them, it talks to them, makes them part of it. And that eventually Google thinks that with enough information, the ability can, can crunch it, we can solve any of the social problems facing humanity. And that's a sort of metaphysical point, which I might return to later if I have more time. Um, but I think what we're seeing is that we're seeing that these tools for change that were envisioned um, by Stafford Beer are now being uh, essentially, if there's ever been a time for them, that time is now. So we're seeing that we had these so large scale social movements in 2011, Egypt, Spain, quite small but interesting in the United States as well. Um, but they all eventually hit a wall, right? <clears throat> so they all encountered the same problems that actually the United States encountered at the end of World War II, which is, you know, we've had a massive social collapse, nation states are collapsing, we, people have lost all faith in government, how do we establish a new kind of governance where people do believe, where people do, I mean, ideally have actual autonomy and freedom, and how can we present the tools that allow people to reorganize society? And if those don't happen, 
And if we can't build those kinds of tools, um, then effectively these new forms of diffuse power, rather than being, I would say, liberatory, what is coming after the end of the nation state is also new forms of diffuse power, which have, I would say, very uh, I would say reactionary um, sort of ideological foundations. So you can see that there, there is you know, very heavy use of cybernetics and at least social media by you know, a very sort of diffuse kind of transnational power by organizations like ISIS. We have to take that seriously. And at the same point, at the very historical moment when we're, it's true, when we're, 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 we're facing this sort of epic crisis in the ability for our nation states to function, and as the cybernization societies just start taking off, people feel that, that cybernetics and computer science are in general not fulfilling the purpose. That, uh, that, that, that Silicon Valley is just producing sort of dumb apps, the, the Yo app, for example, right? And furthermore, um, the, the, the people who seem the most skilled at, you know, while, while Stafford Beer imagined that we would put the worker at the center of the sort of cybernetic command and control structure, and that we, it would be democratic and participatory. Um, and, and what you're actually seeing is that there is a giant control structure, at least a surveillance structure being established, and it's not democratic participatory. In fact, uh, you know, no one until recently even knew about it, you know, although many people suspect it. So we have the National Security Agency revelations. And so we do see, and there's tea on the back, um, is, that, is that we are seeing that throughout the world as more and more people who are technologically skilled are skilled, let's say, in encountering these sort of uh, periods of collapse. We're seeing more and more apps, these sort of tools for change being built. And that there's even a, a, a desire that if the nation state itself is collapsing, maybe the only way to establish some kind of uh, freedom in the face of the perhaps you know, ongoing I would say move towards a, a sort of completely lawless and camp-like uh, sovereign order that we're moving towards is to have a, a sort of Bill of Rights or Magna Carta built into the internet itself. So this is Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, this is Edward Snowden. And Edward Snowden makes a very interesting point that it hasn't been fully digested by most people. But he says, yes, I believe we need this sort of you know, Magna Carta of the internet, this sort of Bill of Rights, but we need to code our values not just in writing, not just in an abstract statement, but into the structure of the internet, into the structure of the technologies themselves. And then there's some concepts about what that could be like. You know, Tim, of course. Some of it's sort of very traditional, rights of free expression. Some of it, though, directly deals with the internet. Network neutrality, low cost, protection of private communication. But in general, I think we haven't, and I'm going to stop now, I'm going to hand off to Sorry. We haven't actually resolved the, the, the problem that was brought up by, by, uh, by Mead and Bateson at the dawn of cybernetics itself. We don't yet understand how to build, although Smari, Smari will attempt to uh, explain his, <laughs> some of his concepts on this to us, how to build social cybernetics in a way that can actually replace collapsing nation states. It's clear Google and some other companies have ambitions to do so. It's also pretty clear they haven't built the tools because it's not working right now very well. And at the same point, um, there is a real concern, I would like to end with this little point, um, from Norbert Wiener's sort of um, last book, that we, we, we have to, to really understand if we're going to build tools for social change, tools for uh, democracy, tools for freedom, how can we make sure that those tools don't end up being just another control mechanism to reduce, you know, and what does it actually mean to have autonomy and freedom? Can we live with Bateson's operationalization of this as optimal learning environments? Or is there something deeper that we have to be able to articulate and understand when we're building these tools? And Norbert Wiener warned us that we have to be very careful in trusting our tools too much. That 
And I'll just end with this. Of the grand priests of power, there are many who regard with impatience the limitations of mankind, and in particular the limitation consisting in man's undependability and unpredictability. But what fuels this is the desire to avoid personal responsibility by placing responsibility elsewhere, on the machine, which uh, a device which obviously can't understand the, the situation it's thrown into. And then Bina points out that this was also the defense of Mr. Eichmann. So I just said we're at a very crucial, he was of course part of a larger machine, that we are of course in a, a situation where these types of machines are being called for and must be programmed within this generation. But if we do it wrong, and if we don't think it through, it will, we will have to live with consequences which could be even worse than we possibly imagine. And now, with that uh, happy note, <laughs> let's move to uh, Smarty's take on this. Right. I'll, so just, I'll just be your skip forward another one. Okay, so uh, actually, because that last bit reminded me of, uh, of this statement that I can't remember who said, but it was, uh, technology is not good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And you know, it's, uh, it's a good reminder of how technology basically tends to do what we want it to do, and uh, often very exactly so, uh, regardless of, of what we uh, think about it. And uh, it's, it's kind of in that vein that, um, in 1970, when uh, Salvador Allende had just taken over the presidency in, in Chile and, and uh, said, well, okay, you know, we, we need to build up our economy. It's, it's, uh, it had been through some recessions and so the, the global price of copper, which is Chile's one, and one of Chile's main exports, was, uh, was in a slump. And um, they were like, okay, we, we need to do something new, something better. And, uh, and I... I uh, don't know exactly how it came about, but for uh, some reason uh, they contacted uh, uh, the British management technologist Stafford Beer, uh, who agreed to come over to Chile, and uh, you know he's a um, you know big kind of happy Englishman you know, with a big beard, and, uh, and he he shows up and goes, uh, okay, you know uh, I've got an idea of how we can how we can make things better. Uh, so he sits down with President Allende and, and he draws a series of five boxes that explain uh, the different uh, levels of this idea. Where at the absolute center you have the workers who are providing information constantly to, the, to their factory about what, uh, what the factory is supposed to be doing and, uh, or, or, or what they are doing within the confines of the factory. And then this is passed up to, uh, to kind of the factory hall which uh, then aggregates all of that information and then passes it up through this series of telex machines. And so, you know, thinking about this, uh, this is basically, telexes are uh, 1970s internet. And uh, in a way, this idea was, um, was, you know, an early idea of how to build an internet. And ultimately, when, uh, when uh, Pinochet took over, funded, of course, by the CIA, as is well known now, um, what, the, what America was essentially doing was destroying the internet so that they could build their internet because they needed the global price of copper to go back down. It had gone up so much during the, uh, the experimental uh, three years that Project Cyberson had been going on. But he continues drawing these boxes, uh, going up to the municipalities, going up to the regions, and, and then finally uh, he uh, draws this fifth box and says, um, and this compañero president is you. To which uh, Allende replied, "At last, the people, <laughs> you know, like, um, uh, and and it's un unclear whether he was uh, considering himself to be the people in a kind of Louis fourteenth uh, sense, or or whether uh, whether he was uh, thinking of himself just as a delegate for them." But um, so you know, you can go on. Um, so this is kind of uh, explains uh, part of it and. Uh, of course, the worker is uh, in there, and then you've got. Uh, the, the, he actually did this on two levels. So one of them was uh, was kind of vertical through society, so the different uh, management layers of society, municipalities, regions, etc. And then on the other hand, he also wanted to do it through different sectors and branches of uh, uh, different types of companies that were operating. And of course, in 1970, this was a kind of insanely ambitious idea to basically connect all of the companies in the country 
to some kind of like internet thing and have them communicate with each other on a constant, continuous basis. Um, but there it was. So uh, I'm, I'm not actually going to uh, spend too much time talking about Sucker Beer or Severson, but rather uh, reference his work and, and kind of um, the, the kinds of things that have been happening as a, a side effect of his work, um, uh, both in, in kind of uh, the questions of political organization and, you know, El Pueblo, uh, but also in relation to, since Harry got, uh, my, mentioned that I was involved with the pirate parties, uh, into uh, into it and and then just questions about experimenting with democracy as a as a thing. Um, so um, so uh, what uh, this is actually a quote that uh, from uh, from a essay that uh, Beer wrote called "Unfair for Effective Freedom," which is well, it was a it was a speech that he gave and. Uh, generally, reading through his stuff, uh, you know his his comments on the project, uh, it, it was pretty obvious that you know he was he, he was absolutely a socialist and and saw the the kind of traditional model, the capitalist model of uh, of industrial uh, functionality, to be uh, somewhat um, against the idea of freedom for individuals, and so um, uh, the. One of the kind of questions that uh, was kind of neatly packed up by Kim Stanley Robinson uh, is, if democracy and self-rule are the fundamentals, then why should people give up these rights when they enter the workplace? In politics, we fight like tigers for freedom, for the right to elect our leaders, for freedom of movement, choice of residence, choice of what work to pursue, control our lives, in short. But then we wake up in the morning and go to work and all these rights disappear. We no longer insist on them. You know, uh, and for most of the day, we return to feudalism. And, uh, you know, because once you have that kind of managerial structure in place and that kind of hierarchy, then there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of weird implicit stuff uh, that, that comes out of it. So, taking some of those thoughts, uh, I was involved in founding the uh, Icelandic Pirate Party in 2012, and we won 5% uh, of the seats in the uh, Icelandic Parliament in early 2013. Um, and our platform was pretty much structured on the idea of access to information and self-determination. So that essentially comes down to uh, increasing availability of information to increase the, uh, the quality of decisions so that people can make better decisions if they need more information. And then increasing direct participatory democracy, uh, which increases the agency of the individuals within the system. And the, the kind of the thesis was, if we do both of these things, then people can uh, govern themselves effectively. But if either one of these is missing, which is the case in most democratic, or you know, in countries that tend to be democratic today, then uh, you, know, you, you don't have transparency and you don't have uh, that kind of uh, effectiveness. So at the end of the day, you know, it, all, it really comes down to questions of authority and structure thereof, or, or which structures are uh, most amenable to generating liberty uh, and welfare, and uh, so a viable structure of authority must necessarily yield requisite variety or eventually fail. And uh, I'll get back to that thought a little bit long, uh, later on. But uh, but you know another idea there is that um, perhaps the definition of a good government is one that you can safely ignore. Um, so um, so there there's all sorts of protocols. Uh, protocols are uh, are a good way of thinking about a lot of this stuff because protocol uh, protocol is essentially just a language that we we communicate with each other in. It's a way of exchanging information, and uh, and you know societies are operating on on different types of protocols. But you know some of these are very explicit and some of them are very implicit. So Larry Lessig showed that there were uh, four major categories of governance. Um, uh, protocols, so law, norms, architecture, and markets. Uh, this was uh, in uh, one, of, one of Francis's uh, papers referred to as um, uh, so largely equivalent, so legal control, mutual monitoring, internalized restraint, and market mechanisms. So uh, those aren't necessarily fully overlapping, but they, they do roughly the same thing. And But laws are, are some of the more prominent uh, Mechanisms and uh, and they they are the most readily amenable to being studied. Uh, it's 
it's uh, it's very important that we don't overlook it. Uh, the other ones, uh, for instance, I'm I'm quite interested these days in just uh, how much uh, how much architecture is being used to manipulate how people behave. Uh, it's it's a fascinating thing, but it's very hard to study. So, but if we ask what is law, you know, what what is the law? Well. First off, it's a social software project, right? It, it, the product is a piece of software that runs on top of society and uh, and tells society how to function with regard to certain uh, inputs. So uh, the legal code base is open source in the sense that everybody can read it and uh, potentially you know make revisions. Although generally this isn't done by everybody; it's done by a small committee. So um, uh, so there's like a committee. Of developers who are in republics, or you have some kind of uh, dictators and, and their cronies in, in uh, non-democratic countries who are essentially developing this this legal code base. Um, so, and actually, uh, in some countries like the United Kingdom, the, the legal code is uh, is under copyright. Uh, uh, in fact, crown copyright, which is <laughs> a, a fascinating thing if you're interested in copyright law. But uh, can you move on? Oh, um, so, um, yeah. So yeah, changing the legal code is um, uh, um, is something that you know is very tricky. Uh, if you if you mess it up, then then you know uh, the changes take effect immediately, and you can have all sorts of bugs that come up. So you know, buggy code can lead to monopolies, dictatorships, revolutions, poverty, genocide, economic collapse, wars, what whatever. Uh, and uh, but minor crashes are generally quite salvageable. So, uh, the, but then you know you ask, okay, what is all this law going to do? Well, typically you have some kind of mechanism for accumulating taxes, pushing it through into some kind of governance structure, which then uh, constructs or, or provides welfare, warfare, infrastructure, and extra structure. So, um, uh, extra structure including stuff like diplomacy and, and whatnot. Um, uh, but more kind of in the traditional social, uh, so, uh, sociology vein, uh, government is seen as a regional monopoly of violence, um, um, which uh, also means a regional monopoly on tax extraction. And um, but nowadays, and you know, historically, uh, those those rights were mostly around the the issue of making venture warlords rich and, and powerful, uh, but. Um, uh, but more recently in history, there uh, there have been more and more infrastructural obligations put on governments, and they, they have to do more uh, man uh, construction and management of infrastructure in order to uh, be allowed to uh, exist. And when coupled with the kind of economic realities of, um, uh, of the nation state and, and capitalism kind of interacting, you tend to get a very centralized system that is actually relatively fragile. Uh, it, its fragility uh, comes uh, up in things like hundredth waves, where you've got uh, uh, big seventy-year cycles on on market behavior, and then you've got uh, market crashes. Uh, I think the World Bank registered one hundred and sixty-eight uh, individual market crashes between nineteen seventy and two thousand eleven. Uh, Not exactly a stable cybernetic system. No, <laughs> uh, you know, very very prone to explosion. Uh, so, but oh wait, um, so. But on the other hand, you know, people might say, okay, this stuff, this system of governance is kind of crazy, but you know, uh, we have a lot of people. There are, there are 7 billion people in the world, and, and a lot of complexity emerges. I mean, just the number of connections uh, between people is roughly asymptotic to n squared. So, um, so that means that if you have 150 people, which is a relatively small and manageable number, uh, referencing Dunbar, that comes out to uh, 11,275, uh, I think, uh, connections between people, which is, you know, you, you get a lot of combinatorial explosions. So, um, so perhaps because of this complexity, there is this tendency to, uh, for authority to start to aggregate into hierarchical structures where the communication pathways are a lot simpler and, and you can have these more, um, uh, more, well, simple and effective protocols of communication. But uh, one must ask, you know, was this intentional? Was this something, you know, was hierarchical rule 
uh, an objective of the political system, or is it just a side effect of, of how people have been governing? Uh, and of course, you know, historically uh, it was, and you know, governance by venture warlords, which is a term from El Saita, uh, who, uh, so venture warlords are the people in societies who, who essentially uh, try to gain control for the purpose of, of creating some kind of new social structure and, um, and essentially define how the society functions. But, uh, you know, historically it has been the norm, but hierarchical governance has never been a stated, explicit goal of democracy. You know, in, uh, on, on the contrary, democracy by, by the very term is, you know, doesn't imply any hierarchy. But then the implementation details, coming back to, you know, periods of time when people had to actually ride horses into parliaments and have free time to do so, you know, the realities had to kind of force people into that kind of, uh, into the structure. And, you know, uh, so it's, it's really uh, a side effect of ineffectual systems design. People, you know, were, well, when they only had horses, that was the best we could do. But as Beer put it, that uh, when a society fails to define its objectives, its consequent self-indulgence and freedom is met by a running tide of authoritarianism. So, uh, and, and most of that is, um, emerges in the form of things like institutions. So uh, institutionalization of, uh, of whatever needs to be done is one of the kind of core tenets of, of modern societies. It's, keeps coming up again and again and again. And uh, even Illich criticized this by suggesting that, uh, that the institutionalization uh, leads people to confuse uh, process with substance. So people start to take, uh, uh, confuse uh, an education from le for learning or uh, medical attention for healthcare and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but you know, maybe individuals are a better measure and uh, at that point, you get into these questions about agency. Uh, you can go on a little bit further. Uh, so, deinstitutionalization basically moves agency back to people uh, by distinguishing between the process and the substance. But uh, institutions uh, are very, very bad at, uh, at uh, interfacing or communicating directly with networks. Uh, so, for instance, when you've got these protest movements, uh, one of the things that kept being said again and again during, for instance, the Occupy movement was, uh, who is your leader? Who are we supposed to talk to? Who, are, who represents you? And, and the protest movements that kept saying, no, we don't have a leader. We, we, you know, we are communicating as a network. Uh, and, and as a result, there was no communication pathway between them. Um, so, uh, and, and then comes this, uh, what, what, um, uh, Eleanor Seda and I called the wire hypothesis, referencing the TV show The Wire, um, uh, which suggests that um, the limitation of each agent's scope of action contributes to the total societal scope. So, uh, uh, effectively, um, uh, when a person uh, is incapable of doing uh, something within the system, uh, that in inability translates into inability on a societal level. Um, and uh, that means that a society can only really change within the realm of what is considered possible uh, with, with respect to existing agency. Um, so this is one of the things that happens very frequently in, in societies where you see uh, massive uh, corruption in the form of um, uh, bribery and, and stuff. You, you have uh, people who could effectively just stop paying bribes. Uh, and you have people who could effectively stop receiving bribes, but uh, if either one of them were to, to stop participating in the system, they lose their ability to function within the system. And, uh, and that can, kind of leads to this kind of interesting uh, corollary of the good regulator theorem, um, uh, which states that uh, if a system is to govern another system, it, uh, it needs to have at least as much uh, variety as the system it's intending to govern. Uh, but uh, you, governance cost, uh, like there is always cost to governance, uh, or uh, at least you, you can assume that there is always some cost. Uh, and what happens then is that uh, the corollary comes out that you know if a governance is in, uh, supposed to self, uh, if a society or an organization is supposed to self-govern, uh, 
then by definition, because it's the same thing, uh, it has the same variety as itself, meaning that it can only self-govern if the organizational overhead is zero. And how does one accomplish that? The human body doesn't accomplish it, so we eventually die. Uh, or how are we going to manage to self-organize societies without, without some kind of structure? Um, uh, you, okay. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so in complexity theory, you get this uh, um, statement that every automata is equivalent to, to some kind of language. And if we uh, recognize that institutions, just as in the diagram earlier, uh, the government is a thing with fixed inputs and fixed outputs, uh, it of course can do all sorts of weird things in the process of its functioning, but it is for all intents and purposes an automata. And that means that, you know, according to the complexity theory you know, concept, uh, there is a language, which is to say a protocol, which is structurally equivalent to it. So most institutions could, you know, be replaced in theory with some kind of formal, explicit peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol. Uh, and uh, and actually, some uh, some institutions, such as schools, could be replaced with implicit or informal protocols that uh, don't require. Uh, like the explicit definition of language, but uh, go on. So there are actually in society two major uh, explicit communication protocols that we use every day. You have money, which we use to communicate personal intent. I intend this for me, and it is a mesh topology network where there's high levels of liquidity and there's all sorts of interesting properties that you bake into a monetary system. And then you have votes, which uh, uh, have a star topology uh, in terms of communications, and you, uh, you have very, very low liquidity, but it's where you signal societal intent. I intend this for society. Both of these are, are really just ways for us to communicate in a formal, structured way. Um, but, you know, most people would say that uh, you know, having uh, availability of more money means that you can do more things. Uh, but it actually is a question of having good liquidity rather than having lots of money. So if you have billions of euros in bonds but can't free up bonds to buy an ice cream, then you know, your ability to function is, is somewhat artificially limited. However, if, if you've got, you know, even if it's only 10 euros, you can probably buy an ice cream. You know, and that, that kind of liquidity and fungibility comes in. But, um, but with votes, you get a completely opposite thing because uh, because you have no liquidity in in the democratic process. Um, you know, you the votes that you get, you get one vote created by by the government and handed out to you once every four years or thereabouts. And there is a legal requirement for you to invest it on a particular day on a relatively small set of things. Uh, you know, and that's your total social intent capital for for that period. And you know, as we know from, from having observed politics, uh, the return on investment is pretty bad. So you know, modern democracy as a result looks pretty much like this. You have people who are interfacing with the entire political system through this, uh, these parties, and uh, carry on. Um, uh, and you know, in, a, in an example, you might have uh, two seats that are being fought about, uh, four candidates running, and the 57 voters who, who distribute themselves like so. Now, of course, only two guys are going to uh, win, which means that 63% of the voters are, are getting it. Now, this is a first-past-the-post voting system, but, uh, but just to um, uh, understand, mostly when you're expressing political intent or political will, support for uh, competing ideas tends to fall on the Warren's curve. And uh, if you carry on. So, you know, you, uh, and the options on a Pareto distribution. So, if you have, um, uh, you normally calculate some kind of seat value, and in this case, uh, this is a hypothetical uh, uh, thing where you have uh, three seats in a first past the post voting system, <coughs> um, then, you know, th those three achieve the seat value, and the rest of the vo votes are essentially wasted. Um, now, you know, and this is effectively in the previous example, this is if 28 to 29 voters had chosen each winner, the, uh, including the other candidates, uh, which is a ludicrous system. Like, nobody would actually want this, and this is why there's been all sorts of innovation on different voting systems, such as 
uh, single transferable vault, where the likelihood of votes being wasted in this way is, is reduced greatly. But, um, uh, but effectively, modern representative democracy becomes a system where you are forced systematically to compromise early and compromise often. You are always throwing away more and more of, of your political intent. Um, so some people suggest direct democracy as an alternative, and, and they go like, oh, okay, uh, that's really good, but I don't have time to, to you know, internalize and understand all of the nuances of uh, VAT law or, or you know, import tariffs or all of these things. And, well, you know, to a large degree, that's right. So in the traditional voting systems, uh, a lot of people, you know, well, typically you get either yes or no, or you get to choose some kind of uh, option, or you can just abstain or not participate at all. And, um, but if we add the third option, where you can delegate your vote to any third party, you start to get lots of very interesting uh, properties, especially if you allow uh, uh, transitivity within that. So you could do this on different levels. You could do this on a general or topical or, or per-ish basis. Um, so, general being, I'm apolitical, I don't have any opinions, but I trust Harry, right? Um, that would never happen, but it would Probably be... Probably a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, or topically, you're like, uh, I know a fair bit about, um, uh, about, you know, information technology. I know nothing about agriculture, really, but, you know, I know people who do know things about agriculture, so maybe I'll trust them with, with my vote in their, that case. Uh, or you can do it on a pro basis, saying, uh, like, I, I follow the telecommunications law relatively well, but I just didn't manage to read that particular bill, and, you know, thankfully, Harry read it, and, you know, I'm just going to trust him in this particular case. So, dictatorship, as a model, is essentially what happens when everybody delegates to the same person. Now, nobody, in reality, that would never happen. <laughs> but it is effectively the same thing, just uh, from, a, from a systemic perspective. And you know, coercion comes in, into play there. Uh, but representative democracy uh, is essentially the exact same thing, exact same model, except with, uh, with the, a few more dictators. So you could say that representative democracy is a highly advanced form of dictatorship. Um, and so, but this here is a much more interesting system. So uh, carry on. Um, uh, but there is a problem there. We've got that cycle. So, um, so you know, that those are people who are delegating in a circle, and we can't have that. So we must define it as a directed acyclic graph. Okay. Uh, once we have that rule, which thinks all the time. What? Which think? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Uh, but they do it like with a stability vector on the. They assume that the things a Markov chain. Um, so we can't do that uh, with this. But uh, ultimately, the, the people who don't delegate end up deciding everything. And if you go on further, um, they, they decide with different uh, voting power. So, um, so with this kind of, all of this stuff, I know it's been a bit of mishmash of different ideas, but uh, putting all this together, uh, we, uh, we started this kind of uh, discussion in Iceland back in uh, 2008, which led to first the Shadow Parliament project, which was essentially just a, an idea of uh, running a website which scraped all of the new law proposals from, from the parliament and allowed people to vote on them. Now, of course, uh, this didn't have any formal uh, power or uh, anything like that, which interestingly led us to the observation that people will not participate in systems unless they actually think that they're meaningful. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it seems pretty obvious, but, uh, but it did take a trial and error to, to actually discover that. Um, and then, uh, at the same time, the pirate parties were, were uh, being created, and, and the pirate party in Germany uh, took this uh, idea and, and kind of ran with it their own way and started to uh, use delegative democracy within their own party structure. And we thought, that was a really good idea. Um, the, the software they developed is really bad, like phenomenally shit. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, but they they did it, and, and it's been working to a certain degree. Um, and then uh, the Citizens Foundation in Iceland started Better Reykjavik, which doesn't have the delegation, but has a lot of the other thinking uh, in there. Uh, and then okay, um, and then they expanded to Better Iceland. Uh, so. Bitter Reykjavik actually 
uh, is run by the City Council of Reykjavik, and, and they do actually pull the ideas in and, and allocate funds to them in various ways, and that's a bit of a long story. But, uh, and then, then they built uh, your priorities as well. So that's just one foundation that I'm not actually even associated with, but uh, friends of mine, and, uh, they're doing really interesting stuff. But, um, but then, you know, coming back to Beer, he says that liberty must be a computable function of effectiveness. Uh, for any total system whose objectives are known. So, you know, not knowing the objectives has been a pretty big problem with, with democracy for a long time. Uh, partially because nobody really agrees what the objectives are, but also in the sense that there are all sorts of non-objectives that have been kind of just baked into it historically uh, as kind of a side effect of having to use horses in the old days and having had pretty bad systems design. Uh, and, and then, you know, uh, but even if if we do manage to nail down the objectives, then moving to a delegation model of, of liberal democracy, it implies computability. And, and that's a kind of nice result to get out of, out of everything. Uh, but there are a bunch of open problems. One of which is that mapping, uh, so nobody has actually gone and done the work of mapping the complexity classes of institutions. So, you know, is the tax office a regular language? Uh, we, we don't know. It probably isn't. Uh, anybody who's filed a tax report turn uh, knows that it's probably Turing complete. Um, but you know, uh, we need to actually understand the complexity classes of these institutions, and then we can establish a well-ordering and figure out which ones we can uh, protocolize. Then you know, uh, we need some kind of general language of protocolization of executive processes. So uh, a lot of, of stuff is hap uh, happens in society through this kind of fiat of uh, let's just try something. We, we feel like we need a new university. Why do we need a university? Well, we need education. Okay, let's just build a process under which you know, uh, uh, the goal is somehow attained without necessarily understanding what the elements uh, of that um, structure uh, actually are. So you, know, you get a lot of like, fuzziness. Then we, oh, sorry, uh, we don't have any boundary theorem for organizational overhead. So. Uh, this is this is a very important one in, in terms of figuring out what the size of society can be. Robin Dunbar famously stated that you know it's 149, or well, most people say 150 because they haven't read his paper. Uh, but um, uh, but you know 150 is a number which is assumed before you have any technological uh, additions into it. And I'm pretty certain that you know having seen how, how mass movements are organised on Twitter and Facebook and so on that uh, technology has the ability to artificially augment the number of people who can effectively collaborate in society. But we, we don't know, we don't have a boundary theorem for, for how that works, uh, nor how to do it at scale. We don't have um, any good tools for network institution interactions, meaning um, when, uh, when protest movements such as Occupy decide that they want to communicate with the police about a uh, rally that they're going to do, uh, in order to you know, somehow help everybody out. That just doesn't happen, and we need better tools for that. And then um, one of the weird things that you know, all of this kind of falls apart on is you know, even if you manage to replace representative democracy with a, uh, a system of um, uh, direct democracy mediated or otherwise, um, sorry, then um, what always happens is, uh, okay. um, you, know, you get that and you then replace all of the execu executive structures with protocols and how people communicate with each other, but jurisprudence is left behind and unless we come up with a really good model for network jurisprudence, we're always going to have to have courts in the traditional sense. So, uh, but otherwise, you know, we, we have ideas for how we might be able to replace the legislature and the executive, and that's a good starting point. So, uh, and all of this kind of follows quite naturally from, from projects like CyberSyn, although, of course, CyberSyn was economic primarily, and all of these experiments have been um, uh, more in the political realm. But, yeah, that's, that's it. So, um, right. So, so I think it's